So we're gonna get we're gonna get started because this is gonna be recorded, and I, I wa really want to give the people that showed up uh, something special and uh, to join us in a conversation and you know make this as informative. So we are this is the first time Gene and I are doing this, and we uh, we are friends and colleagues, and I want to tell you what you're gonna expect to hear uh, in your time with us. So just a reminder, this is our first time doing this. If you have questions, either send put them on the chat, and we're gonna try to get to them. And I also want you to know to direct message us as well. So what you're going to hear tonight is, is given this uh, absolutely crazy time, I think it's easy to say it's a crazy time, unprecedented COVID crisis. We're going to have a conversation, Gina and I, about some things. And you're going to hear some things very, very, uh, very, very important, things that people have been asking us about, things that people have been worried about. You're going to hear about crisis and the brain's response to crisis, both for, for children and for adults. You're going to hear about... Uh, regulation and co-regulation. We're going to talk a lot about that. Um, we're going to talk about something known as the three great states and core four. Now, if you want to know more about core four, Gene and I are on a special project and, and we're going to stay tuned to getting to better Facebook page and Dr. Gene Clinton, uh, Dr. Gene for kids on Facebook, uh, but also drgeneclinton.com and um, briviaconsulting.com as well, where we have so many things to share over the next several months. Uh, it's going to be great. You're also, what we're gonna do throughout with your questions and with our interaction and with the, the evening we have planned is to, to offer practical strategies for how to deal with crisis, how to deal with children, how to deal with each other uh, through this. As I was gonna say, we're recording this so you can view it again, ask your questions. So I'm gonna introduce you to my friend uh, and super esteemed colleague, Dr. Jean Clinton, somebody who I love very much. And she said, she hopes she has something to share from her brain. She has a massive brain and it's only, it's only like eclipsed by her heart. So Jean, introduce yourself and tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you hope for tonight. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks. It's so great to be here and, uh, uh, and sharing this time and space with my good friend, Steve De Groot. So um, I am an infant, child and adolescent psychiatrist by training. I'm a mum and a nana by passion. And uh, I spend a lot of my time um, doing what I call knowledge translating. So I take the science of stress, I take the science of the brain and find ways that it makes sense to me in, in very accessible ways. So I have, as we'll hear more from Steve, I have a, a, big, a big need to reach out to people and, and make a difference uh, in whatever small way that I can do that. So that's a, a big passion for me, a big drive for me. I have some mantras that you'll hear such as love builds brains and, and we absolutely need relationships, relationships to, uh, to, to get through these, uh, uh, these challenging times. So that's a little bit about me. And what about you? Over to you, my friend, Steve. Yeah, hi. I don't know. I, I, people call me uh, an authority on human behavior. I've been working with humans my whole life, much like people attending. Um, you know, I used to be, I do a lot of things, but my biggest, my biggest passion is for children. So I used to be a professor of human behavior theory uh, and practice. And uh, I share a very a big passion with Gene, which is uh, how can we make lives better? How can we give people a better chance um, and give them information and strategies to make their lives and the lives of their children or the lives of their partners better. I am the co-founder of uh, Brivia Consulting. Um, so briviaconsulting.com is sponsoring this. My, my team is behind this as well. So welcome everybody. So yeah, that's, that's a bit about me and we're gonna get into this. So we're gonna start by talking about, and if you're curious about what Gene and I are talking about, please uh, send cross questions, comments, let us know what you like. Uh, we are going to talk about the potential impact of crisis on 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 the brain, uh, and well, just on parents and on on, on children. So so we're going to get to the brain in just a second. I want to talk about crisis. So Steve, can I just just speaking of crisis? Oh, yes, uh, yes. My my uh, my dear colleague and assistant Simona is saying that she can't see or hear anything. Have we got oh. some feedback from people that it's actually okay. it's yeah. actually. Going yeah, live. People are saying hi, Gene. Hi, Steve. Hi, everyone. Can okay. somebody in the chat? Can you guys? Can you guys hear us? Break. Is everything fine? Yeah. So it looks like we're getting. Yeah. So if she can go to the Facebook, the Getting to Better Facebook page, uh, uh, she should be there. Okay. Yeah, people Great. are saying. Uh, yeah. Our team is saying. Yeah. They can hear us. 
and they say that we look great. So thank you. <laughs> right. and, and my That's, name under my name underneath there is in some kind of hieroglyphic. Yeah. So Jean is in a wit, uh, a witness protection program. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, a, yeah, right. yeah. Actually, there is some number. It's not your name, um, right. but I think everybody from the comments they know who you are. Thank you, Courtney Grundy. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, this is great. So let's talk about not the impact on the brain yet, but let's just. I'm yeah. going to talk a little bit about crisis. Now, what's really important is for everybody listening to know something very important. It's not the crisis, but it's the experience of the crisis that makes the difference. So everybody who experiences the same crisis is having a very different experience. Us, our partners, and our children. And that's really important to know. That's something we're going to get back to is how, how to understand the experience of the people that we're responsible for so that we can take better care of them. The second thing that I want to say is that there's going to be a lot of strange behavior with, with each other, with our children, especially with what's going on. And that people are saying, you know, people are crazy. These, you know, what's, what's wrong. Uh, these are abnormal reactions. It is so important for everybody to know that during this unprecedented crisis, we are having normal reactions to an abnormal situation. So that, that is absolutely important because there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with your children and there's nothing wrong with your partners. We are experiencing a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. And that is important for you to, to, to cut yourself some slack, to be patient, to be tolerant. Now you're gonna hear about the three great states. I'm gonna pass this over to Jean uh, right away about what, what the impact on the brain and how the brain responds to, to crisis. But before I get to that, we're gonna be talking about something called the three great states. Uh, you're gonna hear about safe, situated, uh, and significant, safe, significant, and situated. And what, that, what that's about is that human beings, all of us need to feel safe, physically, emotionally, socially, mentally. Uh, that's important. We also need to feel significant, which means we need to feel valued, cared for. We need to feel valuable. We need to feel a sense of belonging and connectedness. The third one is situated, which is we really need to feel like we've got focus, like we have purpose, like we have goals, that we have something to look forward to. And just to follow on the heels of what I was saying about this unprecedented crisis is for everyone to know that our three great states have been obliterated. For most of us, our three great states, the things that keep us safe, the things that help give us value, the things that give us purpose and direction have all been turned on their head. So that's really, really important to know. So you'll hear us talk about the three great states and how you can create them and how they're important. I'm going to pass uh, it over to Jean right away. And Jean, don't ever wait for me to pass it to you, sister. Right? You can just cut me off. But I want to ask you about um, the brain and what is the brain's response to, to crisis, fear, or uncertainty? And what do we need to know about that? Yeah, well, you know, I want, to, I want to reiterate a couple of the things that you've said, Steve. And one is that um, stress and what we're experiencing now, as you said, uh, is not something to be afraid of. What we need to recognize is that stress is the body's reaction to perceiving that there is threat in the environment. What is unusual about this point in time is that the threat seems so all pervasive. And what, what happens when the, when the brain experiences threat is that deep down within the, the brain structures, there's a, an area, there's a limbic system, the limbic area, and there is very overly simplistically, I'm explaining this, but in the, in the limbic system, there are parts like the amygdala that fire up when they perceive stress. And when they ordinarily, what happens is those parts of the brain that come in and soothe the amygdala, turn off the signals that it sends out, the adrenaline, the cortisol, when that, the, that comes from new learning and from memory that says, oh, this isn't such a scary time. This isn't such, we went through this before and we're okay. So that closes and quiets the amygdala. And that means when your amygdala is quiet, you can think through things. When your amygdala, that limbic emotional area is quiet, then your smart brain can activate. What is unusual about this is that there are things that are bombarding us. 
that are making us feel that the whole world are all of our capacities are being stressed and stretched. And so we see different things like, um, uh, for example, um, the, 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 when we're all in balance, then we, we can be calm and we can be alert. But when everybody is doing something, we're vigilant. And you know, when we saw everybody going out and buying toilet paper, that's flocking behavior, right? You say, you know, you can imagine those flocks of birds as they move and change direction. So that is a part of the brain saying, what's going on here? What's hugely important though to me, Steve, is what you've said. And that is how can we in these crisis times create the control of the things that we can control? So how can we think with our kids, with our partners, with our, our, our other educators that we're working with or whatever our domain is, how can we help them feel safe in this period of time? How can right. we help them feel significant and yeah. feel situated? And I think as we get into this, we've got some, we've got some ideas uh, together, you and I, about how we can help people regulate so that they're able to relate and then they're able to reason as right. Dr. Bruce Perry talks Dr. about. Dr. Bruce Perry talks about. So there's two parts of the brain I, that you said are very, that I think it's important for people to know about. There, there's more than that, but you said the yeah, amygdala yeah. is the reactive brain, right? That's the emotional brain that kind of freaks out when, when all this stuff is going on. And we need to, it needs to be calm so that we can think clearly, so that we can make decisions, so that we can reason. Is that what you're saying, Jean? Yeah, but it, we have it for a very good reason. So we mm -hmm. have to respect it and we don't have to battle it all the time. So when right. we experience stress, it is the body's response saying, do something here. So we right. have to respect it, but we right. also have to be able to moderate it. We right. also need to make it uh, do everything that we can to make it more predictable, our right. environs. So right. that is what helps, uh, that's help, what helps soothe that right. part of the brain. And yeah. we have some people that are saying they like your flock analogy. Uh, and we've talked, uh, a lot of people are familiar with fight, flight, right? So our brain is wired, and that's important for people to know, is that, um, a shout out to Bruce Perry, right? Uh, relation, you know, relate, regulate, reason. Um, so that, I think that's really important for parents who are dealing with kids that are having difficulty reasoning. We'll get to regulation right away. That relationship is the most important. That if we're not regulating, we can't reason. So trying to reason with somebody before they're regulated is, is, a, is a recipe for frustration. And we'll, we'll get to that right away. It sounds, so, so what you're saying, Gene, is our amygdala and our reactive brain helps keep us safe. It's actually an alarm system and we have to respect it. So it's important to know that fighting or flighting, and we also will add to flock, but fight, we often say fight, you know, fight, flight, freeze, right? Total paralysis or flounder. And we're seeing a lot of people floundering right? Floundering is when the behavior doesn't really make sense. And, and Gene, you have a great question. It's don't ask what's, um, what, what's wrong. Ask what? How things are going. Yeah. Ask how things are going or what's going on, right? That's what we got to ask. On. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so what, how does the, how does this kind of stress impact children's brains, Gene? Well, I think, so what we know is that stress, how did we learn about stress? Well, we learned about stress through behavior, observing first of all and then mm -hmm. we were able to we being the big the scientists were able to look from behavior to actual physiology mm -hmm. so kids don't say oh my goodness me i'm so stressed what's going on just now they 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 act out they act out so yeah. they they the it's not that they are intentionally trying to drive you crazy it's that they're in development of how do I figure out when I've got these emotions, these feelings within me that I don't know how to control, how do I manage them? And what we're learning is as long as parents can have in their brain that this is stress that's causing the behavior and not bad behavior or, or misbehavior, that it comes right. from a place of stress. Like it's like the tip of an iceberg. Mm -hmm. that says you know okay the 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 the, the sibs are fighting uh, yeah. again and they're doing it to drive me crazy because they know that i have to get all this work done for work and then i also have to make sure i'm off the computer so that they can get on their live stream at school and they're just doing it to drive me crazy while well, they're not they are right. picking up your stress 
they're right. picking up your stress and your distress and that stress and distress has a contagion effect and what they're really really seeking for is right down at the very base of needing and that is can you regulate me mum can yeah. you regulate me dad can yeah. some adult in my life make come in and make the world feel safe predictable that the stressors are moderate and that i can move forward right so i think it's really important here we might bounce around there's some questions about what do you do with children that are withdrawn that aren't that aren't kind of freaking out and i think we all respond differently to stress now now you're talking about children's impact the impact on children's brains but regulation us adults gene you're one of my regulators like a lot of people on the on, on the call on the facebook feed thank you everybody uh, i dysregulate all the time Right. And we all need to, 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 and I think it's important for parents and partners to hear that we need to, and you've said it before, lend them our calm. That we can, if we can be regulated, children especially, but other people in our environment pick up our dysregulation and it actually can create a greater dysregulation. Absolutely. Right. And, and, and I think that's important for people to know that if we want other people to be calm around us, especially our children, we must be calm ourselves. So yeah, and, and I, I so agree with you, Steve. But you know, one of the things that I'm sure people are saying out there, well, it's easy for you guys to stay calm because you still have your job. You know, I'm in childcare and I just lost my, uh, I just got laid off. Um, and, and so what do we mean by lend your calm? And can you lend your calm when the world is chaotic around you? And I think that's, that's where I, I'd really like to say that if we can, uh, if we there's a couple of things that we can do. Uh, if we can say, I'm going to control the things that I can control. What my kids are going to remember after this is how I made them feel. So yes. finding my calm means how can I focus on the moment? I can't change the numbers for COVID. I can't change the fact that I lost my job, but I can be fully present with yeah. my kid right now, seeing them, listening to them, yeah. hearing what they have to say, listening, listening, listening to them. Yeah. I can read to them huge regulating, huge yeah. regulating activity. So yeah. lots of people don't know where their happy place is. Yes. And one of the outcomes I'm hoping of this dreadful time is that people are going to realize, man, oh, man, I had better figure out what soothes me, yeah. what makes me feel OK. I've got some suggestions from some yeah. experts, but yeah. I think that's going to be really important that yeah. lend your calm means, you know, this be present in the moment. I can't change what's happened. Yeah. I yeah. can't make something come from the future, yeah. but I sure can be present in the moment. Yeah. It's not yeah. easy, yeah. but it's absolutely doable. Yeah, and, and a lot of people are agreeing and, and it's, it's hard to find your happy place. We'll talk a little bit about that. And I think it's important, Jean, we're talking about parents as well, but partners uh, also be aware of that and leaders, people who are in positions of leadership now, there are employees across the world right now that are dysregulated that need a leader to step in and help create the three great states to help to help calm them, to lend them their calm. Um, I wanna go into the core four now because I think it's important for people to hear, how do we know how this impacts us? And I said at the beginning of, of the, the, our, our conversation uh, that, that it's important to understand our experience of the crisis, not just the crisis. For every 10 children that experience it, for every 10 people, they have a different experience. Now we're gonna introduce a, a, an idea called core four, and it has to do with our, our own experience. And the core four, we refer to needs. What do we really need in this moment? Our values, not necessarily the big V values, but what's important to me right now? Is it, is it connection? Is it to be, to be soothed? Is it to have some sort of direction? What is important to me? That needs, values, and goals. What are my goals through this? What am I hoping for as a result of this? And finally, what are our strengths? Now. Now, I, I know we're bouncing around a bit, so core four, we'll talk a little bit more about, but when we're talking about tuning into our child's experience or our partner's experience, and this is really, really big for partners because partners have to be good with or without children, right? We, we are in the same space where we're not, I mean, self-isolation is really not self-isolation because you're by yourself physically, but you shouldn't be by yourself relationally or emotionally. And that is really, really critical, right? It's such a misgiving term. So core four, needs, values, goals, and strengths. 
And, and I think what's important for partners and for parents is to tune into what do they need right now? What's most important for them? What are they hoping for? And what are they doing well? And now I, I, I'm going to pass it over to you, Jean, um, because I, I'm going to emphasize this and get back to it. In a crisis, it is critical to focus on the positive. It is critical to focus on what's going well, because a lot of times we get tunnel vision and everything, all the news looks bad, all the, all the news sounds bad, are, are the, the reports of everything, our friends' experiences, our employees, and are, we're all scared, but it's important to look to the, the good things that are happening. That's one of the greatest forms of self-regulation is when somebody says, hey, just look over here for a second. That's actually working. <laughs> so we get out of our amygdala and into our executive functioning and go, actually, okay, there's some good. Let's, let's keep this going. Jean, you're leaning yeah. forward. Tell me what you're yeah. thinking. Sister. Well, well, one, I want you to repeat those questions again, um, um, Steve, in terms of the, the, for the, the core four. Okay, the core four. So starting with yourself, because it's critical if we're going to be somebody's uh, co-regulator, it's critical that we understand what do I need right now? Now, many of us, us adults don't even know, like, what do I need? Do I need to exactly. connect with someone? Do I need quiet time? Do I need, you know, to be right in this conversation? Do I need somebody to hear me? The next question is, what's most important to me? What's most important to me in this moment? It could be, you know, it could be cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> but what does that mean? That, you know, uh, it could, what do I want? What am I hoping for in this, in this moment? You know, do I want it to be over? Do I want it? Do I want somebody to explain it to me? Do I want, right, just to be left alone and just shut them, right? I'm waiting for someone to drop the F-bomb here. I know you said flock, Gene. I don't know. I don't know yeah. if I'm going to say it. And then the final one is what's going well. What's going well for you? And th this is important for parents too, because we sometimes think that they're always scared. Sometimes they're doing way better than us. Chil children are so resilient that sometimes they've got, you know, they're under they have an understanding of, of what they need in the moment or what's most important to them. And it's important for parents to tune into that. And I think it's important for partners, especially that are living in the same space, to first tune into their own. What do I need? What do I want? And share it with each other so that you can navigate that space together because you're going to need to be good to each other. Gene, do you want to add uh, to that? Yeah, well, yeah. So, Steve, I, I really, I think this is so important. You know, so the people who have joined us here are people who who know your work or my work and know that this concept of being reflective, of stopping and thinking and asking these questions, what do I need? I think, you know, I'm a psychiatrist, a child psychiatrist. I think many of us have gone through life with our emotional world kind of under a under a, a bushel basket that mm -hmm. and now we're having all of these we're having all of these emotional reactions and so i love the idea of the core four to stop and think about well what do i need what is important to me? What do yeah. I hope for? What do you need? What do you hope for? I, I think it's so, I think it's so very important. And one of the reasons for that is when we can activate and connect in to our, our prefrontal, our, our, our thinking, uh, organizing part of the brain, we know from a developmental perspective that when kids start labeling emotion, so they've got the feeling and then they put onto it a label, then they're better able to start uh, self-regulating, but it really yeah. is co-regulating. And I think just so it is in the adult world that as we're able to look at our, what has meaning for us and how can we look at this, our, our, our needs, values, goals, here's the battle. Yeah. We have a brain that has a negativity bias. Mm -hmm. Negativity sticks like Velcro. Right. Positive slips over us like um, uh, uh, like like silk. So yeah. we need to be intentional with our with our thinking. Uh, yeah. We need to be uh, uh, doing what many, many of the people who may be involved in uh, working as a therapist know that we have to be looking in on our thoughts. Yeah. And yeah. we also need to be looking in on our emotion. Yes. There's a great book, um, uh, Permission to Feel by Mark Brackett uh, on, from the Yale Center on uh, Emotional Intelligence that is really, uh, I hope, 
uh, pe more people will go to that site and say, my emotional world, I have kept away from. Yeah. And now, yeah. holy moly, it's front and center. We have to be paying attention. Yeah. Once we've got our emotional crapola together, <laughs> we're so much better able to reach out and help our little ones through this yeah. time. Our emotional crapola. Uh, that's a, that's great, right? <laughs> and I, I see a lot of people, you know, we're in the same space. And that's the thing that right now we're, we're we have to learn to connect closely. Um, and we have to connect from far, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and what's really important, and, and I love that people are loving the negativity, negativity sticks. And I think what's also important is, is what sticks, whatever we think about, and then Jean, you and I talk about this, what we think affects how we feel determines how we act. And it's critical. What are we telling ourselves right now? Are we perseverating on the fear? Are we like the, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, nothing, nothing, never, never, always. We'll just create the, we'll, we'll just dislocate your executive functioning and it'll allow the emotional brain to get in the driver's seat. And we can't let the emotional brain in the driver's seat because it hasn't got its license yet. It doesn't know how to drive. It will never know how to drive. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, and you know, uh, Steve, I can I can give you a, a real life example of the um, uh, control what you can control and focus on what you can focus on. Yeah. So as you know, I've got uh, I've got some of my 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 kids are in the front line. One yeah. a, a, a paramedic and a, another yeah. a, an ICU doctor. And I could say after they're finished a shift, oh my. Lord, when is the next one? When am I going to have to worry about it? Or I can say, thank goodness, I can be grateful for the fact that they have made it through a week or a number of shifts, that they have done the best that they can and that they have helped others. Right. I can choose what worry I focus on. And yes. so I'm choosing, I'm choosing because I have the ability to do that these days. Yeah. I'm yeah. choosing to say, I'm grateful. And, you know, just a word about, uh, about gratitude. I thought that, you know, people would give me gratitude journals or talk about it. And I thought it was all kind of airy fairy. <laughs> and then I looked up, you know, I love the brain. And yeah. so I looked up the neuroscience of gratitude. So, you know, this, what you think affects how you feel affects how you act. If mm -hmm. you take mm -hmm. it through a gratitude lens, what the science shows is that when you actually, what Rick Hansen calls, take in the good, so stop and be present in the yeah. moment. When you take that in and you're grateful for that, it changes the biology, the chemistry, the dopamine, the serotonin in the brain. It makes yeah. you happier. Yeah. It even makes you healthier because it yeah. changes your immune uh, response. And it leads to you being more likely to reach out to others. Yeah. To, yeah. To, with empathy, with empathy and compassion. So it's yeah. interesting taking that being able to halt and focus uh, and yeah. makes it makes it the sciences are really, really accumulating it, yeah, which is good. Affects yeah. how you feel, affects how you act. If you yeah. think, oh, my Lord, the, the sky is falling. We're never going to be able to, to see each other again. Yeah. Uh, affects how you feel. I'm anxious. I'm overwhelmed. I can't go on. Affects yeah. how you act. You overeat, yeah. you watch too much television, you drink yeah. too much. Or yeah. you Gina, say, I thought we were going to keep this not personal. Could you oh, stop yeah. talking about <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, Gene. Yeah. All right, so yeah, you drew yeah. first one. Yeah, no, and, and, it, and it's such a simple thing. And I think this is, uh, this is important for parents and partners to, to, to think about, is that what we feel affects how we feel, determines how we act. Yeah. And now we're going to talk to partners and parents and, and every human being here. Now we can only hold ourselves accountable. So you can, you can listen to this again after this is over, but it's critical when we are thinking about what kind of partner do we wanna to be to our partner? What kind of parent do we wanna to be to our children? This is where the core four is very important. What do I need from or for my children? What's most important to me as a parent or a partner? What values are important? If they're respect and if they're uh, patience and if they're uh, growth and if they're second chances, those are values, Yeah. right? And then what do I hope for from my children? Well, the three that are still, it's like it's transcended time, right? Since Socrates, you know, responsible, <laughs> respectful, productive, right? <laughs> right? What do I want for them? So, and this is really, this is gonna be really, really important for everybody listening. Only you can hold yourself accountable, which means, if you're about to say something to your partner or to your children, stop before you do that and ask, is this in line with what I need and what I want and what I value as a parent or a partner? 
If the answer is maybe or no, stop, <laughs> right? Stop. Is, is yelling and flying off the handle in this moment respectful or good for growth or good for the relationship? No. So why am I doing it? Oh, that's my need. That's my, that's my need. That's the amygdala's in control. That is not helpful. Right? I say to people, like, thank goodness for self-isolation, because you know, when it starts to go, just run out of the house. Just run. Just, just, just go. The streets are empty. There's probably no cars in your neighborhood. And just get away from the moment until you get that amygdala under control, get the executive functioning calm, regulate, and reconnect with your core four. Is your behavior as a partner, as a parent, in line with what you need, what's most important to you, and what you want for your partner or for your child? Because you can't have Jean, the psychiatrist, coming in and going, you should, you should, you should, you should. Because no matter how much we love her, she's going to piss us off and we're going to get angry at that. Right? No matter how much human behavior expertise I have, I can't tell you should, 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 should. Only you can tell you what's important to you. Right? And your partner deserves that and your children deserve that. Anything you want to add to that, Jean? We're going to move into giving specific things around safe, situated, and significant, and, and get to, we're trying to answer some questions as they come in through the conversation. Anything you want to add to that piece I was just talking about, Jean? Yeah, well, you know, one of the, one of the things that, uh, one of the questions that's come in has come in from, uh, from Susan um, asking, what, what do I think is going to be the biggest, or what do we think is going to be the biggest challenge facing children and families and educators? And what, what, what advice can you give as we transition through this time? And I can't really, I can't think of any better advice than what you've just talked about. <laughs> you oh, know? thank you, Jean. Yeah, yeah no, I really, I, I, I really I like having do. you around. Yeah, I think, I think what's going to be my, my biggest worry is that we are going to see more anxiety, that we are going to see people who are more fractured from what Steve, you've just described as the core four, mm -hmm. that people are, are going to have lost a sense of their, their meaning, their purpose, their hope. Um, uh, and uh, I'm very worried that we're going to see a very massive escalation in um, uh, in mental health challenges, both in adults as well as in uh, as well as in kids. And so I think uh, the messages that you're giving, the messages that we are talking about about connecting, about relationships, and some of the the direct strategies we're we're talking about now, are going to be so very very so very very uh uh important and yeah. you know it's um uh it's something that i'm hoping that as a medical profession and uh you know all, all of the professions who are interested in the well-being of of children are going to start thinking together about what are the strategies what are the things that we need to have in place so that our well-being can be maintained when things come back to some state of, yeah. of calm yeah. Yeah. And it's unfortunate. I've been using the term we, we were off balance before COVID. Yeah. Right? And what I mean by that is there's been a lot of anxiety. Um, there's a lot of chatter, you know, on the on the stream right now on the, the comments about anxiety being an issue. Uh, and yeah, I mean, anxiety is a lot about the brain. Right. And, and we're not going to get into the, you know, if you want to know more about that, we've got this is just the first of many discussions we're going to be having and and trying to get more resources for people. Um, you know, back to the worrying, I love Amos Tversky's, he was a mathematician, uh, the late Amos Tversky, one of his sayings was, uh, why would I worry about this? Because I would have to experience it twice, right? So it's such a, such a cute way of going, you know, if we worry too much about something, and I say, we have to be careful about the what ifs, because if we keep talking about the what ifs, they may never happen. And we, you know, the what ifs pile up, and we may just continue to, to ramp up or amp up that amygdala. Right. And we need to calm it and we need to yeah. soothe it. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think that I think that's a strategy that works for those of us who don't experience this um, um, uh, ongoing anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. I think the 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 kind of training, if, if you are someone who is susceptible uh, to more anxious thoughts and more um, anticipatory fears, then. Uh, it's the kind of recognizing of, oh, hey, hey, here comes in that anticipatory fear again. Yeah. Here comes in that what if brain, that, that kind of thinking. How am I going to put that in a package that I'm going to look at and say, well, hang on a second. 
is that real? Are, you know, are you really, are you really truly, is this the worst that's going to happen? And, and you, and you can then put it aside when you, when you put it up in the corner. So it's easier for us to deal with things if we don't have underlying um, ennui tension. Yep. You know, I, I was talking to a colleague today um, about uh, what are some of the emotions that we, that we avoid. Yeah. So we're just talking about anxiety. But mm -hmm. one of the emotions that I avoid is sadness. Yeah. I don't like feeling sad. And part of it I recognize now is because I've experienced depression in the past, I'm worried yeah. that this sad feeling is going yeah. to go over that precipice and yeah. end up depressed. But the reality yeah. is I've had much more sadness and I've had depression and it ain't going there. <laughs> but, it, you know, but it is that it is that it is that um, shying away from the yeah. emotion that are yeah. harder for us that I think yeah. we're really going to need to we're really yeah. going to need to spend more time thinking about to get through this. Yeah, and there's a there's a couple of great questions and thanks, Jean, and thanks for the compliments on the on the on the comments. Forgive me for looking back and forth. We're trying to catch or, capture as many. Um, something I want to want you to think about, Jean. It was a question, so I want you to think about this while I comment on one of the questions. So I want you to think, Jean, about how can parents talk to children about this, about COVID? So what is your advice around what, like, what should they say and how much information should they give and, and, and just what should they know about how that, so I'm going to give that to you for a second. There was okay. also a question about how we can help each other with anxiety and how, how can parents help teachers with stress? How can partners help parents with stress? How can we help each other? Now, I'm going to go back to um, these very specific questions that I may have been going, it must be a thousand times this week that people have found these questions helpful. So I'm going to share them. They're, they're related to the core four. We can't leave a place unless we arrive. This is really important. If I want to help somebody with anxiety, we can't leave that place of anxiety without arriving at an understanding of what that means to them. We can't leave a place of stress unless we understand what does that stress mean to them, right? So the questions are, before we can really help the people that are in our lives, we need to ask them, you know, what's most important to you right now? You know, what are you worried about? What do you need, right? Back to those, what are you hoping for? To give us a clear understanding, because often we worry that what we're afraid of, they're afraid of. And that's not, that's not the case, actually. They're afraid of other things. And we have to really listen to capture what of their core four is, is operating right now so that we can leave that place of stress. Are they worried about their job? Are they worried about their child's development? Are they worried about, you know, mom and dad breaking up? Like, what do we really know about this from their perspective? Be patient. They know on some level. And if we can access that core four, we'll be better able to provide the support that they need. And for those people that are confused, for those people that are confused, just listen. <laughs> they don't need you to, to answer and to give problem solving. Just, just listen, 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 relate, 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 connect, connect, connect. So over to you, Jean, for that question about um, how can parents talk to their kids about COVID and about this current crisis and what kind of um, suggestions might you have? Well, Steve, you've already, you've done it again. You've already uh -oh. answered it. So what's the number <laughs> one thing? The number one thing about talking to kids about COVID-19 is to listen first. It's not about telling them the facts, but first we need to listen and ask them what they, you know, just what you've talked about. Uh, what, what, what are they hearing? What are they worried about? Are they worried about it? What does it mean to them? So listen to what they have to say. We also need to think developmentally. So a little four-year-old, uh, we can talk about um, we can talk about not being able to see our friends or go to play school uh, just now because uh, we have to just stay really close all together as a family and play and do lots of reading lots of reading at home. But there are things that you can do like wash your hands all the time and <laughs> cough into your sleeve and you know those <laughs> those kind of practical things which are I mean, very different than what you do yeah to, to, uh, <laughs> uh, with a fourteen year old. Uh, yeah. And I think, uh, you know, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, middle school and older kids, I think it's so important that you listen. You start with uh, uh, that part of listen to them, relate to them, say, I can, I really get how you're worried about things. But, you know, 
it's they call it social distancing, but it really is only physical distancing. We can do as much emotional connection as you can absolutely think about. So let's separate out physical distancing from emotional distancing and do tons of emotional connections. And so that's the other thing is connect, connect, mm -hmm. connect, connect, connect. Yeah. There, um, uh, the, uh, there are some specific things that um, we can talk to adolescents about. And I think uh, in, on one capacity, we can say that there are many people in the world whose full-time focus just now is on keeping us safe. There are very bright people who are doing a lot of work. So let's focus on that. Let's turn off the media or at least have a diet of media, mm -hmm. not have it going on all the time. It's not how it happens. You know, my friend Kathy Lee was talking about how um, uh, the, the chief coroner in New York said, you know, we, we, move, we move bodies all the time in refrigerator trucks. We have all kinds of places that we put the homeless uh, bodies when we don't have any place to go. It's being exaggerated with a, you know, a zoom on it. And it's not that out of the ordinary. One of the things that is a conversation and a question that has come up is what about kids who are hoping to go off to university and colleges in the um, uh, in the fall and that's been put that's been put at um, uh, in jeopardy and I think the only thing that I can say is control the things that you can control. You yeah. can't do anything. The universities and colleges are absolutely going to have to come up with a strategy about how to manage this. They're, 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 that's, their, that's their realm of influence. Yeah. What you can do as, a, as an adolescent, you know, as someone preparing to go into university and college is control what you can control. And that is stay healthy, stay healthy, keep up your studies and the things that you're interested in, but find something that really gets you excited, mm -hmm. that you can learn something about that gets your creative juices, your creative juices going, rather than just focusing on, I don't know what's going to happen. Oh, woe is me. What am I going to do? Yeah. Focus on what you can do. Yeah. Figure out for yourself. What do you need? What's important to me, you know? Here you yeah. go. Hit it again yeah. with those questions. Just, just add water, right? It's a, it's a recipe that everybody can use. And I think that's, uh, you know, people are asking, how do we return to work? And how do we return to, you know, there was a great post, like, you know, before we run back to that normal that we called it, before we run back to work, be, which aspects are the most meaningful to us, right? And getting back to that core four, you know, is that what I really need? Is this important to me? And in what way do I want to return? Right? What supports do I have in place? Um, there was a question I didn't want it to go by was about what if you have toddlers that can't communicate and, and they're, you know, they're um, out of control or their behavior has changed somewhat. Now, Jean said something really important earlier. Our children often manifest or pick up our energy. So three and under, two and under, if their behavior changes, something in the environment has changed. Something is they're, they're either absorbing our energy. So if we can stay regulated, they will stay regulated. And that's really important. So if, if there's changes in behavior, and as we said earlier, don't ask what's wrong, ask what's going on. And Gene and I will tell you there is a reason behind every behavior, right? There's an unmet need happening. There's a goal, you know? So it's really, really important to go slow, to listen, listen, listen. Now getting into some of the practical strategies, I know we have about... Uh, 13 minutes left or so for the time and Whoa. we talked we talked a little bit about a little bit about um about the three great states safe significant situated and i want to go backwards because situated was about goals and and uh significance is about value and belonging and safety is about that sense of physical social mental and emotional safety so we're going to go backwards so situatedness is about goals and people are like saying well what can we do how can you keep people situated well it, routine is important, isn't it, Jean? What, what does routine, how helpful is being situated for the brain, for children and just people in general, having goals and something positive to focus on? Yeah, yeah. So um, the brain likes predictability. Uh, and so uh, Bruce Perry, if you go to neurosequential model, uh, COVID-19, there's a whole series of terrific videos with, uh, uh, with Bruce chatting. Um, but what he talks about is uh, to manage our stress, we can either be pushing things to make it predictable, creating routines, 
and we can make the stress moderate and be able to manage things, or we can push it over to the other end of chaos where it's not predictable and it's over overwhelming. What are the things that can push it over into being predictable? And he has, a, there's a great, in psychology today, there was an article on, on the, um, uh, the parents toolkit for the pandemic, what parents need or something like that. And so what, did, what, what is it that, uh, that can make routine so important for the brain is yeah. have a routine. Not a, not a rigid thing that you have to, but get up at the same time, make sure you get dressed top and bottom, that you get dressed, not just your PJs uh, for, for Zoom time. Um, get, uh, have decent sleep, make sure you're getting decent sleep. Watch how much media you're taking in. And remember that media that's going on in the background has a repeat every so many, so many minutes. But kids don't know that. If you've got the media, if you've got the TV on in the background, the kids yeah. are hearing the same stories, not knowing it's the same story, thinking that it's augmented. Yeah. Exercise. Find your calm. Have family meals. Yeah. Reach out to other people. And have something that you're focusing on, a goal exactly, as you've said, something that you want to accomplish. If you do, and these are all outlined in that fabulous Psychology Today magazine, if you do that, that brings your brain to predictability. Yeah. What will shove it, what yeah. will shove it over <laughs> is if you've got, this is from Bruce, if Bruce Perry, if you've got minimal yeah. daily structure, you're yeah. doing comfort eating, you've got too much exercise, too much media, minimal exercise, emotional isolation, you're self-focused, you've got sleep disruption, you're negative and ruminative, yeah. then you are in the place of chaotic severe um, and you have much higher vulnerability. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, we're going to have to back that up and review all that again, Jean. Thank you so much. So that situatedness is critical, right? Having a goal, having something to look forward to. And I think it's also really critical for people, you know, the days blend together. You hear people say, you know, there's only three days now, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, right? Or what are we doing? And I think it's it's critical that that people have something to look forward to. Yeah. Whether that's tomorrow or a week from now or two weeks from now, they, they have that future orientation that gives them something excited and meaningful. Significance is important. There's lots of questions about how do we build children's resilience and during a time of crisis and how do we support each other? The recipe is the, the same. Relationship, relationship, relationship. Regulation. We need to figure out not only core four, but we need to make sure that each other, our children, our partners, and the people that we're responsible, including ourselves, that we are safe, that we feel valued and valuable, that we stay connected, 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 connected. Did I say that uh, more than once? Right? That we that we find the places where we do find these things, so that we can find them in each other. Uh, and 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 um, sorry. Um, uh, also talking about people are like, well, what about goals? Goals goals are important. Relationship trumps everything. How to care for, lend them, lend them your calm by being calm. Listen to them. Stay connected. Don't judge people's reactions to this. As I was saying earlier, we're having normal reactions to an abnormal situation. We're all going to be behaving in ways that we don't even understand, right? So it's important to calm down and find out what do I really need right now? What's most important to me? right? And, 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 and cut yourself some slack, right? Yeah. Jean. You know, one of the things that uh, just resonated, uh, well, many of the things you're saying is, are resonating for me, um, Steve, but one of the things is, you know, we talk, we talk about when we're listening to kids, listening to them, keeping it, uh, uh, keeping it simple. But I think the other thing that is, that is the power of repair, you know, so say we do blow up, say, you know, we've got the, we've got the toddlers who are acting up and we've just had it up to here, or we're home, you know, we're doing this work, school work at home, and we've just had it up to here and we blow it. We can say, listen, you know what, guys, me too. I'm finding these times really stressful and I'm going to figure out what makes me calm and let's try and figure out if we can do something together in order for me to stay calm. So let's go outside, let's keep our distance from other people, let's go outside, let's be in nature, let's play, let's read. But that repair 
is so hugely, yeah. hugely uh, um, important. It's yeah. so important. Absolutely. You know, can I, there's a, another question, Steve. Can I just start? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, uh, yes. It's a, it's, a big, it's a big question uh, because it has to do with the, the question is homeschooling for parents. Oh, yes. Uh, can be uh, can be really challenging for uh, for many many reasons. So I've yeah. got some ideas about uh, about that, as you can imagine. Yeah. And I think I think one of the very first ideas that I have is that we should not be asking parents to be homeschooling. We should not be asking parents to uh, to be teachers at home. And in fact, uh, my friend Kathy Lee again uh, sent me what the um, uh, Waterloo Regional District School Board sent out to parents. So if you go to uh, WRDSB at home, Waterloo Regional District School Board at home, it's fantastic. We should be seeing ourselves as parents, as parents first, and supporters of learning at home. Supporters of learning at home. And so what they talk about is you do not need to replace school, especially if it's causing stress for you and your children. You are not teachers, don't put pressure on yourself. Yes. The well-being of you and your family is the most important. And then, and, and it goes on, so it's really worth looking at. And then my friend, John Malloy, who is the uh, director of education in Toronto. It, this applies all across the country. The, uh, the Toronto District School Board's guiding principles as we move forward are prioritize the health and well-being of everyone. Focus on the continuity of learning in a variety of ways. Maintain relationships. So here we've got boards of education who are saying what's important in this time is not that you become a teacher not that you try and stuff the duck as i call it get that <laughs> curriculum in there's wonderful teachers out right. there and yeah. a great letter that i read recently that said we are in the business of education of igniting the flame of learning and yeah. when they come back we'll catch them up wherever they are that's what we're going to do. That's what we're good at. You should be playing, connecting, getting them excited and engaged in what they can learn. Yes. And play and read. And right. Did I say read? Did you say read? Yeah. So and tell us how you feel about that, Gene. You started yeah, yeah, reading yeah. For, the first, for the first time. And I think it's important that, you know, there's questions about the work-life balance. Mm, I think that's an oxymoron now. I think it's also important. There's this work from home, work from home, work from home it's very clear that people are not working from home. People are working at home during a pandemic. It's very fricking different, right? It's not normal. It's not a new normal. The word normal doesn't exist. It's been obliterated, right? And I think it's important for people, Gene, to understand that they are, they need to cut themselves some slack, right? Yeah. Children can't learn when they're under stress. They Children can't, can't learn when their parents are dysregulated. No curriculum in the world is going to help a child who is fearful and uncertain and anxious. So I think above all, parents need to back off of, of, of I'm not saying back off of education because education is more than the curriculum. It's about life. It's about connecting. It's about having relationships, right? It's about coping. And, it, you know, so I think that's really, really important. Work-life balance. I think it's important that there's, you know, that for people and partners, especially that are at home, that you make the time, take the time to set time where you're together, where you're going to be working, and you actually have to schedule life. We used to schedule work. We need now to schedule life because those worlds are so colli are colliding so much, and there's so much pressure coming from work that we've got to we've got to take that very seriously. Schedule time to eat. Schedule time to play. Schedule time to dream. Schedule flexible, time to flexible what? time, but flexible uh, routinely. Time. Absolutely, and I think partners that are in the same space. I think it's important, and parents, you know, um, kids are not only driving us crazy, we're driving each other crazy. Everyone's driving each other crazy. And it's important to take time apart and to understand that being apart is, is that part of that repair, part of that relationship repair, right? So that we can get back into the game. We've heard many times that people, you know, you can't be everything to your partner. You still can't, right? So it's important that you have separate interests and separate time and separate, you know, connecting with other people so that you don't put undue pressure on each other because everybody needs each other to be better than ever now, right? And I think we need to be, to be gentle with each other. So there's a, probably about 10 questions all, uh, all in one there. We have a few minutes. Uh, 
left, Gene. I was going to ask you, is there anything that you wanted to, to emphasize before we're, we're finished? And I'll tell people where they can get more information and how they can stay connected with us in just a bit. But what do you, wanna, what do you want people to know before we're finished, Gene? Well, you know, I guess I want to share, I want to share one, one wish that I have and, and, and one kind of provocation. Uh, uh, First Nations believe that you need to be thinking about, as I understand it, you need to be thinking about the next seven generations when decisions are being made. I heard that from Tom Porter, a Mohawk elder. And so to me, that means, uh, because I'm a child psychiatrist, that right now we need to be thinking about the well-being of the children as a top priority. And to me, that means that we may need to be doing some pushback to employers and saying what is of utmost importance is that my kids and my family and we as a unit are going to make it through this very stressful time as productive citizens will be more productive after the fact if we are allowed the space to function well just now. Yeah. So I would love to see some leadership that said, let's make education of our employers a priority and say economically we'll catch up if we have healthier people making it through this period of time. Yeah. So the only other last thing I would say is to remember relationships are the ingredients of brain building and heart building connect before you correct, if you can remember that, and that uh, love is actually what builds brains. So if we can find through the three great states and these uh, core four ways to connect in with that love and that connection and those relationships, then we're going to make it through this okay. We're in it together. Yeah. Thank you, Gene. And I want to say, um, before I forget as well, thank you to Braden to group my son for helping me set this up. I don't want to, I don't want to forget him. And I want to thank everybody for joining us. And what I've got to say towards the end is, is right now, Gene and I were asked to do this and we we're going to do more of this. Uh, Dr. Gene for kids on Facebook, getting to better is going to be revamped. If you have any questions, leave a direct message uh, at getting to better or Dr. Gene for kids on Facebook. And you can get a hold of us at info at riviaconsulting.com, who's sponsoring this lovely thing and more to come. I want people to know this uh, more than anything. There is nothing wrong with you. There is nothing wrong with your children. Everybody is doing what they can. We have to be patient with each other. I want you also to know that you'll hear there's this, there's a, this, this uh, consistency in the message that Gina and I are giving. And we're working on a very special project and it's called the Getting to Better Blueprint and the core algorithm. And it's called 10 Dimensions of Meaning. And we've given you little bits of it tonight, but one of the things that we want you to connect with is what are the things that keep us safe? What are the things that give us value? What are the things that give us direction? Find those, hold on to those and breathe life into them. Connect with your core four, connect with what you need. What do your children need? What do your partners need? What's most important to you? Hold yourself accountable to that. What do you hope for? And by all means, focus on the good. There is more good going on than we, when we give credit to. We focus on what we think affects how we feel, determines how we act. So be good to each other. And Gene, thank you so much. I can't wait to do this again. Everybody, God bless those who are saying God bless to us. And be good to each other. Be patient. And Gene, thank you very much. I love you. And uh, we, will, we will stay in touch and stay in touch on Facebook, folks. And we'll let you know when we're going to do this again. Thank you, Gene. All and, right. Uh, thank you, everybody out there. Be well, be safe, stay healthy.